Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Path Podcast. This is episode 51. I am Jason. Hey, I'm Derek. And we are so glad that you've decided to join us on the Path today. Um, we're going we're going to recap um, Judges chapter 18, yep. uh, which is kind of like Micah part two. Yeah, uh, We'll get to see the end of that story. Um, and then we have a very special interview for you today that hopefully um, you'll get to see, uh, you'll, you'll enjoy here in just a few minutes. But um, Derek, before we get to that interview, let's talk for a few minutes about uh, some handles to hold on to from uh, Judges chapter 18. I thought it was a, a, a great sermon yesterday. I think it's really applicable. Um, I, I think that especially these last five chapters of Judges, that as it gets down to that sort of surface level of what's going on in Israel, I think that it becomes a lot more, um, it, it, hit, it hits home a little bit more mm-hmm. as um, you see, oh, these people are like me. Um, whereas I think you could you could distance yourself from some of those judges. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, these are national leaders. I'm yeah. not a national yeah. leader. Um, and and I, although every bit of what we've done so far is completely ap- applicable to yes. each of our lives, yeah. just from a... Like a looking at it standpoint, you're like, oh, okay, this person's yeah. like me. Um, yeah. So, so talk to us uh, for a few minutes about uh, the handles to hold on to from Judges 18. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, you left off and did a wonderful job leaving us with kind of, you know, Micah believing that he had, you know, arrived. Yeah. Um, God will yeah. surely bless me uh, now. Surely yeah. bless me now because surely. of, um, you know. A, a Levite, uh, a, a Levite. Uh, come with me. Yeah, hey, hey, come on over here, mm-hmm. dude. I'll pay you. Come, uh, come yeah. live with me. Be my Levite. Be yeah. my priest. That's right. Be yeah. a father to me. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, Micah is pretty comfortable in that. Yeah. And so, eighteen, you see, you know, something really kind of switch. Of course, uh, we, and I mentioned this irony yesterday. You see a lot of irony in in in, in this writing that you know the narrator, you know, maybe Samuel is using to kind of help mm-hmm. us see the audience see the, you know the folks who are reading to see it's it's bad it's just they just yeah. they kind of and so you know things are not good yeah instead of mm-hmm. saying you know there was no king in israel which was the refrain and the people did what was right in their own eyes he just says there was no king in israel yeah and and, and, and the assumption is yeah they, everybody's, everybody's just doing whatever doing the heck they want whatever to whatever they mm-hmm. want to yes yeah and so the Danites, a um, a tribe of Israel, uh, that um, was, um, you know, that was um, wandering. Really, they weren't mm-hmm. in the place they're supposed to be, and it's because they could never conquer it. You know, history shows us yeah. uh, they couldn't conquer uh, the the Amorites. Which again, I think, is another sort of unspoken refrain of yeah. these chapters that no no one is where they're supposed no, to be. Not at all. Like no. they're not doing what they're supposed to be yeah, doing. No they had been a, a, yeah, in yeah the they had been allotted yeah. a particular piece of land. You know, Joshua set all that up before he died. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they were they had to go in and claim it. Yeah. But they couldn't. Right. The Amorites were too powerful. Mm-hmm. So they're like, hey, let's go find somebody who's weaker. You know, mm-hmm. let's find yeah, this is too place. hard. Let's go find something easier. In their travels, some scouts come to Micah's house, and uh, they they recognize this Levite's accent, and they're like, wait a second, that doesn't fit. You're not where you're supposed to be, yeah. right? Which they're not where they're supposed to be either. <laughs> right. And um, they come to find out there's this shrine. It's like, that's not how this works, you know, in a way. Mm-hmm. But the, the funny thing is, is that they take all that, and just go and make you know, use it for their own good. It's, you know, it's kind of like they realize, oh wait a second, we can just do whatever we want to here, yeah, and that's okay. And like it seems to be working. Micah's got a good living. Yeah, let's do it and let's apply that to ourselves. Right. It's funny though. The th- the thing mm. that pops into my mind. <laughs> this is silly, but the thing that pops into my mind is that meme of like the the Spider Man pointing at each other, um, of like, no, what are you doing? No, what are you doing? And and I feel like that's that's happening over and over here where, um, you know, Micah is, he's he's created this thing for himself. And then uh, the Levite comes and he's like, hey, what are you doing here? And the Levite's like, well, what are you doing? And yeah. then, the, you know, the, they figure it all out. And then, um, you know, these Danites come along. Why are you here? Yeah. Well, why are you here? And so it's just, you have yes. all these people yeah. asking questions of other people when they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Yes. Like, why are you here when they shouldn't be there in the first place? Right, right. <laughs> yeah. 
So, you know, the question for yesterday was what happens when we trade faith for a cheap alternative? And yeah. that's really what everybody's doing. Is yeah. that they have uh, crafted their own God, little g-God, or, or their what you know i think some of them's view of the big g god was but it became yeah. an idol it yeah. became something very uh, man made um you know and and, and insignificant mm-hmm. yet they held it up as if it were like on an equal playing field you know yeah it, it's like um you know i would say it's like you know someone with an actual diamond that's got like the certification mm-hmm. of it you know and it's you know, so many carrots, and it's worth so much money, you know. That's something we had to do quite a while ago yeah. in our own life. So right. I remember that. I'm like, oh, yep. let me figure out yeah. the four C's and all that. It's like somebody, it, it, it's kind of like somebody coming in and saying, hey, look, here's this uh, cubic zirconia, yeah. right? Which it's bigger. looks mm-hmm. like it's bigger, but it's not as valuable, yeah. right? Or I would say it's really more like this, that someone goes... Uh, puts a quarter in a little machine mm-hmm. if those still exist. Gets like a fake ring. Yeah. Pops out that plastic little joker and comes and says, "Look at the diamond I have. Mm-hmm. It may be shaped like a diamond. It may, you know, yeah. it's not a diamond. It's made of plastic. Yeah. In it, uh, you know, insignificant, mm-hmm. an insignificant thing being held up against this thing that's really, really, really valuable. Yeah. And that's what we've done is Absolutely. we've taken this man-made thing. And I mean, that's what the, these people in the story did, but it's what we do too, you know? Absolutely. It's what we do too. Yeah. I think one of the saddest things in, in these two chapters is that everyone seems to know just enough to know that the other person is not doing the right thing, mm-hmm. but they but they are not convicted by it enough to know that they're not doing the right, right thing. And, and I think that's really sad that... Um, that they've suppressed that truth to go back to Romans one. That they've suppressed that truth in their own life, but they know enough to point out a flaw in somebody mm, else's yes, life, yeah. which is really sad to me. Mm-hmm. That the people of God, again, they've they have made this trade, this this trade for a cheap alternative that they think in their minds is easier than the standard that God yeah. would have for them. Well, it's the, it's the same thing that the Judaizers did. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, we saw that, you know, when we studied Galatians, mm-hmm. they they held up this man made thing. I mean, it was a, it was a it was a God ordained thing at one point, but mm-hmm. God, you know, did away with that right. that particular law, and it's like, hey, you've got to do this, this, you know. But they were living their lives however they wanted to, mm-hmm. but saying, if we just do this one thing, then we're righteous. It makes us righteous, yeah. And that's not how righteousness works, right? That's not how any of this works. Yes. It's not an equation. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, we and we do that in our days too. If you just go to church, you know, these many days, or if you mm-hmm. are a you know, member of a particular type of church, mm-hmm. or, you know, I mean, we we slap on religious platitudes yeah. to our faith as well and, and like feel real good about ourselves. Right. But, but a lot of times those things are you know, man induced or man, you know, like, right. uh, you know, things that we have dreamed up on our own and have nothing to do with God. That's the thing that happens here is mm-hmm. that, you know, rarely is God mentioned. Micah says, hey, surely God will bless me, right? Right. But he's just assuming that. Um, even the Levite, whose name is Jonathan, we find out later, even the Levite, you know, he doesn't ask God what he should do. Mm-hmm. He just does it and says, the Lord is going to, yeah. he tells the Danites, the Lord will deliver you. Well, he never asked him. Right. That's not how this works. That's like <laughs> not how any of this works. That's not how the prophecies work from old. You know, mm-hmm. That's not how the prophets operated. Yeah. They had a word from God and then they spoke. He didn't do that. Yeah. And they took, they just you know, yeah, just talks. Yeah. 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 And so again and again and again, like no one's really concerned. They want God's blessings, but they have, they don't want God. They yeah. don't want to even know him or relate to him. Mm-hmm. They've, they've made an idol out of God's blessings. Yes. Yeah. yeah, really. Absolutely. So the thing I want to hold on to, so that's kind of an overview. The thing I, I think, you know, would be a helpful thing to, to hold on to is that, um, so eventually the Danites make their way into Laish. Mm-hmm. They conquer Laish. It was a Canaanite uh, city, but mm-hmm. they were peaceful people. They killed them all, you know. Yeah. Um, and they set up, they set up all the things, business, trade, I'm sure, but they set up worship as well. Yeah. And their worship was so 
counterfeit mm-hmm. to what it should have been. But 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 it, but it had the elements. It, it had the buildings. It had the you know they they built high places. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean they built all these things to make it seem like they were doing the right thing. But then they were worshiping gold statues. You know they were they were mm-hmm. worshiping other gods. Yeah. It, it was all. Um, syncretize where all these pieces were oh, let's just do it all and yeah. we'll, you know, we'll catch everything and surely be blessed and and then they had success yeah they right. remained there they were able to conquer they remained there for a long time yeah yeah I mean based on what what, what it says there at the end of, uh, of the chapter it was there for centuries mm-hmm. for centuries yeah. yeah and so what happened there can happen with us we assume when things are going swimmingly right Mm -hmm. uh, when there's successes left and right it must mean god is blessing us or god's righteousnesses are on us or you know we are you know and we we assume we are doing the right things Mm -hmm. because we are being blessed and that's not necessarily how it works um that's like the lie of um someone saying um, if you are not being blessed, you are not doing mm-hmm. it right, which is, which is a lie perpetrated many, many times. You yeah, prosperity. I think of prosperity gospel yeah, stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And, and those you're not having things. enough faith. Yeah. yeah, and and you know the Bible tells us that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, we live in a world that is that is suffering from the sin sickness that surrounds it all. And um, those effects are on all of us, mm-hmm. you know. It's not, and it's not necessarily, oh, you know, God is smiting me or God is blessing me or protecting right. me. Uh, God is certainly there; He is sovereign in it and over it all. But, um, but you know, just because there are successes does not necessarily mean we are in the right. And just because there are failures or things are going poorly or badly does not mean that God is not there. You know, I, mean, yeah. I think about coronavirus, you know, and just it's hit it's hit every household, it's hit every congregation mm-hmm. and and faithful congregations and, and congregations that had a mess in their leadership. I mean, it's hit us all the same. Yeah. And, and it doesn't necessarily mean one church is doing it right and one church is doing it wrong. It just means that the coronavirus is a thing that goes <laughs> yeah. You know, it, regard, it, it, it operates, you know, regardless of, of you know, um, our righteousness yeah. or whatever. Well, and I think it's, it, it's um, so often we try to equate success with doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. And we, we live in a broken world. Yeah. And there are people who have lied and cheated and done all kinds of ima- unimaginable things to get to the top. Mm-hmm. Um, and those people are at the top mm-hmm. in what humanly we would consider success. Mm-hmm. And and I think therein maybe lies the rub is that we're using a human definition of yeah, success we are. and not a biblical definition of success. Yeah. So. Well, and, and I would say there are faithful Christians well, sure who, yeah, absolutely. who <clears throat> they, um, you know, put, put their money into the uh, mutual funds and, you know, and and did well in their mm-hmm. business, and you know, were upstanding and honorable, still at the top too. Yeah, that's true. And so we can't we can't just assume one way or the other because of that. Right. You know, we're not looking at all the data, and there are faithful and just Christians who live their life in in a faithful way to the Lord and uh, don't have all those right. blessings, you know, worldly treasures or whatever either that yeah. we. But they are just as faithful, mm-hmm. just as true to the Lord. And there are people that are rotten, t- terrible people, lies still cheat, that are on the bottom as well. Yeah. And and people all in the middle of, of all these things. Right. Uh, because, and you're right, we have defined worldly success and put it like like um, the Danites did, like, mm-hmm. like Le- did. the Levite mm-hmm. uh, Jonathan did, like... Um, Micah did and say, surely the Lord will bless me. Yeah. Surely the Lord has blessed me. We, we, we've, we've either either earned worldly success or failed to earn worldly success and said and, and attributed it to God wrongfully mm-hmm. one way or the other. Right. Um, and so, you know, I think we, we need to understand kind of the worldly <clears throat> success versus 
human success and uh, worldly worldly success. You can always find it out, right? Mm-hmm. And that is, you go to the root. What is the motivation yeah. of the person, organization, or, right. or whatever? And if it is worldly, usually it is, look at how much I can progress me. Mm-hmm. Look at how much I can move forward, or my organization move forward, or my name move forward, yeah. or my ideas move forward. It's very pride oriented. It's mm-hmm. very uh, haughty. It's very, um, you know, and, and those those things may be masked. You may not see it. Right. But at the end of the day, you'll know um, whether the success is measurable as a, a blessing of God or a blessing of of people by the motivation of the people who got there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And now if the motivation was, you know, I want to be faithful to the Lord, I want to be upstanding and right, I want to be uh, the kind of person that I am, and you receive success, then you might could say yeah. it was because, uh, but you can't say, you know, if everyone will do X, they right. will become successful. Yeah. Again, it's not an it's not an equation no. that you follow. Yeah, no. you're right. And so, you know, I think I think that's um, important for us to realize is that we cannot assume that success determines whether we are righteous or not. Yeah. At the end of the day, what determines if we are righteous or not is whether or not uh, the blood of Jesus covers our sins. Yeah. Uh, Paul said, and, and Paul, if anybody could have, you know, from a human standpoint. Could could have boasted righteousness. It was him. Mm-hmm. You know, he says, "I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I'm right. I'm an apostle. I'm 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 you know, I'm devoted. I've always always have been. You know, um, but Paul said, my righteousness is like nasty rags.' Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and and truthfully, if if success were a determiner of righteousness, there's no need for Jesus' sacrifice. No, there's that's, not. That's a works based righteousness. You're absolutely right. I worked my way up, I did my thing, mm-hmm. and now I'm righteous. Yeah. Um, and then there's no need for Jesus anymore. No, there's not. And nothing could be further from the truth. That's it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So. Yeah, yeah, and at the end of the day, s- true success is um, I must become less, mm-hmm. he must become more. Yeah. Those are John's words. Mm-hmm. Who, who John the Baptist, who had become a pretty big deal. People were following him left and right, coming out to the desert, watching him eat locusts yeah. and <laughs> right you know, baptize people, and honey, <laughs> and then baptize people in his in his uh, uh, um, sackcloth or whatever. You know, I mean his his crazy garments. But when Jesus arrived, he said, "This guy is the real deal. I'm not yeah. even worried. This is the one I've been tie. telling you all about. Yeah, I'm not even worried to tie his sandals. Yeah." Uh, which was a servant's thing, you know. What I mean, it's, I'm not even worthy. I'm not even worthy of that. Yeah. And I must decrease, and he must increase. Mm-hmm. But that's, I mean, that's what this. You know, I mean, uh, to live as Christ, to die as gain. Yeah. That's true success, man. Like, this ain't about me. Yeah. This is about Jesus. I'm here only, but but because of Jesus. I'm here only by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. I am where I am because Jesus decided to bring me there and it is of no merit of my own. Yeah. I did nothing to get here. Right. He did it all. If I am anything, it's because the Lord has blessed me and made me that. I can't do that on my own, you know. Right. I think that's success. Yeah. For me to live as Christ and to die as gain. You yeah. must increase, I must decrease. Absolutely, man. All right, well, hopefully um, you uh, were able to, to grab hold of that handle and you can take that with you into this week. And just remember that, um, you know, all of our strivings are for nothing if we're not doing it for the right motivation. Um, and so I would encourage you to, to focus on that. But um, thank you, Derek, for sharing that with us. Um, we're going to transition now into an interview with our next generation pastor, Roger Stansel. This week, we celebrated him uh, being on staff here for 25 years, which is a major feat. Uh, and so we wanted to interview him and just kind of pick his brain for a little bit. But um, we're going to transition into that interview now, and we'll be back to wrap things up here in just a little bit. All right, everyone. So as promised, we have our uh, friend, our co-worker, Little Rogers. Little Roger. Here. <laughs> little Roger. Um, sorry, it's the tallest seat we could find for you. Um, but um, first off... 
And, and I mean, I know that we have told you, but just so that everybody else can hear, congratulations on being here for 25 years. I Thank mean, you. I know that that's, you know, you don't like to be recognized, and I know that, but that's a feat. Like, that mm-hmm. doesn't happen uh, in many places. And so, um, not in youth ministry. Yeah, well, not in ministry in general. Yeah, it doesn't happen. Yeah, rarely but, in ministry. But, but in yes, general. especially in youth ministry. And so, um, kudos to you for sticking with it. Um, <laughs> but then also, like, look at how good our God is that He's that He's kept you here this long. I think mm-hmm. that's a testament to God's faithfulness. So, um, so we just wanted to interview you and ask you a couple questions. Um, maybe, maybe let's start with this. Um, what, what for you? Maybe tell us. I know this may be difficult, but what? <laughs> are like your top three or four highlights from 25 years of ministry here um, at, at Lafayette First? Um, I know number one is, is when I came on staff <laughs> and when we lived with you. Actually, so we when you lived little... with me, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know if it can get any better than that. I mean, I was going to come a little short of that, but I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. So, <laughs> um, Well, one that stands out is um, when I first came, we um, were going to a beach uh, summer outing. Mm-hmm. And we'd gone a couple of years. And I was trying to convince kids to go on a mission trip. And they were like, mm-mm. Um, but I finally, I don't know, maybe the third year or fourth year when I was here, I talked just a handful. I mean, a handful of, like there was six. And that was another adult to me. <laughs> and so we went. And um, they had such a good time. They came back. And not me but the kids told all the other kids we don't need to go to the beach anymore mm. this is what we need to be doing and we did the next year we only did a mission trip yeah we took maybe nine or so ten maybe I don't remember um, and then it just grew from there uh, so that was kind of fun yeah seeing kids saying no we need to be serving not going to the beach yeah, absolutely. and playing and then doing youth camp at night so that was a good one um Top three or four. If you can only think of two, we understand. That's fine. Well, I mean, there's a lot. I'm just trying to think. Yeah, well, which, I know, and that's why I said I know this is kind of difficult. Which yeah. one yeah. would be the top? Um, well, a lot of things, you know, migrate around mission trips. One mm-hmm. year we were on a trip, and um, we bonded with a group of inner-city Asian kids, redneck Georgia, and some <laughs> Asian. And I mean, we bonded so well that the following year, the pastor at that church called me and said, where are y'all going on a mission trip? <laughs> Our kids want to go where y'all go. And you know, that's pretty cool. And there was a lot, of, there was some um, tragedies that happened that week in mm-hmm. both youth groups and which helped uh, bring them together. And the coolest thing was I was in dealing with an issue and I come out and they're all in a circle on their own, no mm-hmm. adults praying. And so, uh, you know, that's, that, that stands out in my memory. Yeah. Uh, but there's just been, you know, there's been a lot of just good times, things, you know, or the youth building we meet in, the progression of mm-hmm. how that came about and how we took it over and <laughs> changed the look of it. Um, and you know just the good good things that happened there yeah so, for sure so, there you go all right cool <laughs> yeah so my question is um because this is so rare i mean just in ministry in general but particularly mm-hmm. in youth ministry uh, the last church i served there was a five-year period where every year we had we had five youth leaders during five that years yeah. yeah in five years so that's, that's that, and that's more normal. Yeah. That is far more normal than twenty five years. Um, mm-hmm. And then even in the pastorate, you know, it's it's you know, it's go somewhere, serve three or four years, and then you know try to move up the ladder and those kind mm-hmm. of things. So with that being said, what advice <coughs> would you give, like you know, fairly new person in ministry, um, whether it's youth ministry or any kind of ministry, you know, what what advice would you give them about? longevity in ministry and how to attain to that how to find that <laughs> stubbornness well, is number uh, one, right? <laughs> in in this particular situation of course now i've been in um, a couple of other churches too that i served in youth um in this particular church i have so many different jobs 
that um, it's hard, to, as you told me one day, before you leave, you're going to have to write down where a lot of things are. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I, I, I do have, or I did have, uh, you guys have helped take some of the things, but I was doing multiple things. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, in youth ministry, <clears> I, I, <throat> one thing I'd tell folks coming into that, you know, everybody wants to be like the cool, slick, you know, skinny jeans guy. And there's not anything wrong with that. But if that's who you are, yeah. but don't try to make yourself mm-hmm. into something that you're not trying to, to please people because it's not going to fly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and whether you're a pastor or <clears throat> worship or student, children, whatever, you know, you need to be who you are as, as you serve. And, and the people, I think, recognize that more than, you know, trying to put on a facade of something, you know, yeah. that you're wanting to be the super easy guy or the super pastor or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, for me, working with students, you know, I'm not very smart. I just, uh, I, I kind of love them where they're at and I try to be there for them and I think they appreciate that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't always have the right answers because they go through so much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know if, I mean, somebody may have the answers. I I don't have all the answers. (laughs) Um, But I try to listen and I try to let them know that I'm there when they need somebody to talk to. And I think that would be the same as a pastor, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, as you serve people. Um, And, you know, try, I mean, be true to what you are and who you are, but try to, as best as you can, get along with everyone. there's always going to be some that, that that's difficult sometimes. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Um, but just, just try to love them in spite of that. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess you're talking about us now. Loving us in spite of us. Mm-hmm. Is that what you're saying? Well, I mean, I didn't so want... Hard, I didn't, to, hard to get along with. I, I didn't want to say yeah. that. But, I mean, especially since you got me in this tiny chair. That's right. And y'all were towering. We, we, wanted, to, we wanted to tower and, over and, you. Yeah. And I know y'all were sitting like, the, you know, mm-hmm. so it made me feel small. But that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah, well, I, I, I appreciate that about you, um, Roger, that you... Um, like it is obvious that you truly care about the the young people that you serve, and I appreciate that about you as somebody who has two kids underneath your your ministry. It's um, it's apparent that you care about our kids. I mean, the fact that you would FaceTime my daughter while she's in quarantine for a back to school bash that is you have no idea how much that spoke to both Anna Grace and to, to Kim and me as, as her parents. And, and I appreciate that stuff like that. And, and that's just one small example of how you serve. And I, and I appreciate that about you. Um, and, um, so I guess kind of, as we sort of wrap up this time together, um, what would you say, I mean, who would you say between Derek and I is your favorite person? Um, <laughs> and, no, I'm, j- I'm joking. Uh, well, he's the CEO, so I'm going to, I'm going to I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, just uh, know that know that we appreciate you. Absolutely, yeah. Um, we give you a hard time, but it's because we love you. And, uh, well, I give, and because I give you give it, it, and you give it right too. back. Yeah. That's yeah. right. You can dish it out as well as you can take it. <laughs> and I appreciate that as well. So, um, any final thoughts, Derek? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's it. I got That's it. Good. That's good. Speechless. Got. Any any final words of wisdom that you would yeah. love to share with with us and with the people um, from twenty five years of ministry here in this place? Well, if y'all could be more like me, then things would really go well. No, I'm just kidding. We'll start working on that. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. No, I, like, like I said, I, be who you are. and mm-hmm. God God chose you because you were who you were. Mm-hmm. And that's what, you know, you're talking about youth ministers. I, bless our, our hearts, all of us. <laughs> uh, we try to be so many things sometimes, and that's why the, I mean, the average youth worker last for about 13 months, mm-hmm. if that statistic hasn't changed. I don't know if it yeah. has or hasn't. Nope. Yeah, that's still um, the truth. <laughs> and and, I, and there's also, you know, a tremendous amount of pressure working mm-hmm. with students, as as y'all know, with cancel culture and all these things now. If everything's not just hunky-dory, they leave and go somewhere else and makes you look bad. And, I, I mean, there's just a lot of things that you constantly deal with. Um, yeah. Yeah, for me, you know, I'm an old guy and trying to keep up with culture you know i watch movies that i don't want to watch but just so i'll know what they're <laughs> talking about and i 
try to listen to some of the music and so I can, can, can communicate. I, I think it is every year I try to adapt to what's coming this yeah. year. That's, that's my goal is each year I, I look at, okay, what do I need to try to figure out and learn this year to still be relevant? Right. But I think the most, like I say, I think the most relevant thing is kids want somebody that cares. Yeah. And somebody that will listen and talk. And I can do that okay. I can't do computers, <laughs> as you know. That's so, all right. Um, That's all right. I don't mind helping you with that. So. <laughs> so I think that would be my advice. You know, be you or use what God has given you. Mm-hmm. I think it's helpful too. You know, I mean, just think yeah, absolutely. We need we need to get back to that in mm-hmm. in ministry as a whole. Just be who you about are. people. It's yeah. About, yeah, it's about relationships. It's mm-hmm. about knowing people, knowing how much you care. Mm-hmm. That's it. Absolutely. Well, Roger, thank you for being with us today. We appreciate it. Um, You're welcome. Thank you guys for tuning in and listening. We would love to know, um, what do you appreciate about Roger? <laughs> Let us know. You can email us at thepath at lafayettefirst.life, or you can comment on this YouTube video. Um, we'd love to know, or um, we'd love to know your thoughts on the handles that Derek talked about um, earlier in this episode of holding on to um the fact that success is not a measurement of righteousness and how, how, does, how does that impact you? Any thoughts on that you might have? Um, but we hope that you will share this podcast so that other people could hear it. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, I am Jason. I'm Derek. And I guess I'm Roger. That you are. And we hope that you will join us next week as we continue down the path.